And we'll now turn to our last speaker for this session, Wendy Fishman. Wendy joined Project Zero, which many of us are familiar with uh, because of its founder, our longtime member, Howard Gardner, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in 1995. Since then, she's managed various aspects of the Good Work Project, a collection of research initiatives focused on the meaning of education and work in the lives of young children, adolescents, and novice professionals. Since 2012, with Howard Gardner, Ms. Fishman has led a large-scale national study of higher education and has written about education and human development in numerous scholarly and popular articles. She's the lead author of the book that just came out, The Real World of College, What Higher Education Is and What It Can Be, and also a book from 2004, Making Good, How Young People Cope with Moral Dilemmas at Work. She's a graduate of Northwestern. And the title of her talk is The Real World of College. Wendy, over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you for inviting me today. It's a real honor to speak with you all. And I'm eager today to share some headlines with you from our 10-year national study of higher education. First, a word of background. As Linda said, for more than 25 years with Howard Gardner, I've been conducting research on the development of young people, specifically investigating the meaning of work and education in their lives. In earlier studies, we learned disturbing findings about young people and their beliefs and their priorities. As we had begun to talk with college students on various campuses, it was clear that many of them had not thought about the purpose of college. At the time that we began the study in 2012, there were many books about higher education. And indeed there were and still are some excellent ones. But most of these books were not based on empirical research. If contemporary data were collected, they were mostly based on surveys and also on opinion. Therefore, in our study, we sought to collect rigorous data from a range of individuals and institutions in the sector. We set out to design a large scale study of higher education as best we could. It took 10 years from over a dozen different funders, more than 20 different researchers who helped with both data collection and analyses. It also took a lot of planes, trains, and automobiles. Specifically, we studied individuals at 10 different campuses, representing the range of colleges in the United States. Every campus except one was non-vocational, claiming to provide a liberal arts and sciences education. We had one comparison school, the Olin College of Engineering. For more than five years, we carried out in-depth, one-on-one, semi-structured interviews with more than 2,000 individuals across these 10 schools, half of whom were students. This qualitative approach allowed us to listen very carefully to what people said, but also importantly, what they did not say. Then we spent more than two years analyzing the data with both qualitative and quantitative methods, including reliability measures to ensure val validity across researchers. And we spent more than two years writing at first blogs, then articles, and eventually our book. Our work here still continues. An important overarching finding to keep in mind throughout this talk, students across schools are strikingly similar. Before we began our study, we might have predicted that students who go to different campuses would reflect more differences than we found. For example, even the smallest unit, a single word can give us a lot of information about the similarities of students across schools. This is evident in a few ways. First, on the left, in response to a warm-up question, 
students at seven schools use essentially the same words to describe other students. Here, you'll note the words diverse and quirky. This was even before DEI terms were on the tip of everyone's tongue. Second, the graph in the middle shows the similarities of all student words across campuses. Some of the most notable common words clearly highlight what's on students' minds. Words like mom, help, counseling, and grades. In fact, these words foreshadow another important finding. While the headlines are focused on issues of student protests, free speech, as well as financial struggles, we do not find that these issues are a major foci for students in our study. Third, we also find that the framing of students' words are similar. The bar chart on the right shows that students use the word I or me 11 times as often as we or us, and that this ratio is remarkably similar across every campus. Indeed, this lopsided ratio only increases, or we might say worsens, as they get older. Young alums use I 22 times more than we. For extra credit, we also find that students are also similar to their parents across campuses. Here, we find that their parents use I or me 14 times as often are we or us. That's compared to faculty and administrators who use I or me four times as often as we or us. With these contextual findings in mind, I want to move to four central questions I will address in this presentation. Why is it important to go to college? What can students get from a high quality education? What are some of the obstacles? And how can we improve the college experience for everyone? First, why is it important to go to college? In our data, we discern four mental models for college, how people think about college and how they approach the experience. Importantly, we don't ask students to identify their own mental models. This is a holistic concept that we code for after reading and analyzing an entire interview. Therefore, a mental model represents responses to many different questions. Specifically, the inertial mental model is the belief that college is just the next step after high school. There is lack of clarity about what college is for. The transactional mental model is the understanding that college is a way to earn degrees, build resumes, get into graduate school, network with others that will be helpful for a future job. Exploratory mental model is the approach that college is an opportunity to investigate lots of fields and disciplines, to marinate new ideas, try out new activities, and to meet new people. And the transformational mental model is the view that the purpose of college is to reflect who you are as a person, question your own beliefs and values, ponder how you might want to change or grow with the expectation and aspiration that you will develop new ways of thinking about things, including yourself. Here are our findings across all students. Nearly half of the students in our study are transactional, fewer are exploratory, and fewer than 20% are transformational. Interestingly, we find few differences across students at different schools, gender, or even students with different majors. Sometimes we find that students at different schools explain purposes for the transactional mental model. For example, students at the less selective schools tell us that they need to focus on the degree and job in order to be able to transform, to become a different person, to change the course of their life. We call this transaction to be transformational. It's a blended model. This is very different than the transactional students at the more selective schools who see college as simply the means to get the best job. Though our data are not longitudinal, we do find that in general, over the course of college, the percentage of transactional students stays about the same, whereas the percentage of transformational students does increase. 
However, this increase is not always consistent across all schools. This is what we find when we compare students to other constituencies. Here, I want to point out the misalignment of faculty and administrators to students. Conversely, the alignment between students and their parents, represented in yellow by the off-campus. For example, 80% of faculty and administrators have a transformational mental model of college, while fewer than 10% of faculty and administrators have a transactional mental model. So second, what can students get from a higher education? While it is difficult and maybe nearly impossible to demonstrate all the effects of college, we believe that we can show intellectual development of the mind over college. We created a measure called Higher Education Capital, HEDCAP for short, which is the ability to attend, analyze, reflect, connect and communicate on issues of importance and interest. To make this vivid, think about a stranger you might sit next to on a train. After a couple of hours, you begin to talk about a new documentary film. You might ask a simple question like, did you like it? And then naturally you will take stock of the ensuing conversation. For example, you might notice how your conversational partner talks about whether the facts in the film are similar to those facts in the newspaper, the portrayal of gender roles in the film, even the appropriateness of the title. You might notice whether your partner talks about similar films or stories in the genre. Throughout the conversation, you naturally gauge how your partner raises questions, makes connections, and takes perspectives. This is exactly what we did to determine head cap in our interviews, except our topic was college, something that students knew very well. We used a simple scale one to three to determine each student's head cap. Since we can't prove that someone doesn't have any, our scoring starts at one and not zero. We scored head cap in two different ways. First, we de-identified all of the transcripts and blind coded a participant's responses to seven different questions. In this way, we did not know the school a student attended or the stage. Second, we gave an overall score for the entire transcript. We found that these two approaches to scoring were well correlated. So for example, one of our seven questions we scored was our book question. We asked every participant, if you could give a book to a graduating senior, what would you give? We did not score the title of the book. We scored the explanation, the reasons given for why a book was important to give to somebody. In other words, a children's book like Good, New Good Night Moon could receive a high score of three, while Moby Dick could receive a low score of one. We do not score content, but the reasoning. When we look across all students, we find a typical bell curve where the highest percentage of students are in the middle and fewer students exhibit a score of one or a score of three. In many ways, this is not surprising. It is what we would expect from a three point scoring system, which is why we like to make comparisons, which I'm going to show in the next slide. In comparing first year students to graduating students, we find some good news. While the percentage of students at score two stays consistent across groups, we find that graduating students, more graduating students are scored as a three and fewer graduating students are scored as a one. However, we do need to be concerned about the percentage of students that have low head cap, a score of one, even as they are about to graduate. Here, you'll see 12%. That's still a lot of students. While we don't find any major differences among students, we do find some differences across institutions. Some of the schools participating in our study show that students have a lot of head cap growth, while others show a stagnation in head cap, 
which is alarming and a concern for the sector. As a bonus, we did score HIDCAP for young alums in our study. While it is a small group, we find that on the whole, young alums scored similarly to graduating students. This is good news, bad news. The good news is that HEDCAP does not decrease after college, but the bad news is it doesn't seem to increase either. We might say that the first job is not as effective as, the, as college is at building HEDCAP. We do find a significant relationship between mental models and HEDCAP. Students who have a transformational mental model are much more likely to score three on HEDCAP than a one. Conversely, students who have a transactional mental model are much more likely to score a one on a head cap than a three. Put simply, it matters that students have a transactional approach to college. Our data suggests that they may not get as much out of the, out of the experience as those with a transformational or even exploratory mental model. What are the obstacles that stand in the way? As mentioned earlier, while local and national headlines focus on financial issues, sexual abuse, and codes of conduct, including language, or even about great books, courses, or the effectiveness of online education, we rarely, rarely hear about these topics as central in students' lives. Students are preoccupied and concerned about other things. The biggest concern among students was the prevalence of mental health on campus, even if they didn't identify a problem for themselves. While 20% volunteered their own mental health issues, even though we did not ask, nearly every student talked about the struggles of others on campus. In fact, this was one of the few agreements between students and their faculty and administrators. Nearly every constituency agreed that mental health was the biggest problem, even before the pandemic or the election of 2016. Students also talk about issues of alienation from three different entities. They discuss a feeling of no connection to the academic program, to their peers, and to their overall institution. In our scoring, we find that about one third of students express alienation from one or more entities. And at some schools, the percentage is higher than others. We also find that alienation increases between first year students and graduating students. Relatedly, students talk about navigating social tensions on campus, most often pertaining to issues across race or socioeconomic status. Students discuss silos. They note that those who are alike tend to stick together and they would like help to focus on conversing with and understanding the other. Of course, we know that this does, does seem to be a big part of the social sciences and humanities curricula, but we wonder if students are even aware. And now our thoughts my thoughts about how we can improve the college experience for everyone. Here, I move from researcher to clinician, first offering a diagnosis of the problem and some recommendations based on our problem. In general, we find mission confusion in higher education. It seems that the sector has lost its way. Most students and parents and perhaps young alums and trustees seem unclear about the mission of their institution. To please its customers, schools are trying to do too much. For example, consider the word cloud on this slide. These are the key words in the mission statements of the 10 participating schools in our study. Institutions use these words to attract those that come, promises of learning and experiences, which focus on things like leadership, citizenship, innovation, character, creativity, the arts. 
it might be okay for the sector of education to have a range of goals. And of course, these are admirable goals, but a single college or a university can't be all things to all people. Indeed, intellectual development gets lost in the sea of words. Therefore, we believe that non-vocational schools need to get back to its primary focus of teaching and learning, focused on student growth and transformation. If a school says it's liberal arts, it needs to deliver on that promise. Specifically, we recommend that institutions develop a single mission about the importance of teaching and learning and sculpt programs, projects, and centers that focus on this teaching and learning and reduce or drop those that don't speak to this mission. We need to overtly and directly onboard students and perhaps their parents to this message from their first visit to campus and to continue the onboarding process until the day of graduation. If there is a secondary mission like ethics or religion, that mission needs to be carefully intertwined into the curriculum so that it's not simply seen as something extra or just one of many options. In closing, with an eye toward discussion and questions, I wanted to bring you back to the book question that I mentioned earlier, which you might be curious about. We asked every participant of our study, more than 2000 people, to name a book they would give to a graduating student and to explain their reasoning. I'd like to give you the same opportunity. If you feel inclined, you can write the title in the chat of a book that you might recommend to a graduating senior or share them with me at a later point, I'd be happy to compile them and filter them back to you. As you are writing or thinking to yourself, I'm going to share what we found among students. I'd like you to think about what the results tell us about if and how college is making a difference in the intellectual lives of students. Here are the top 10 books. In general, the findings to this question were both surprising and disappointing to us. Three important headlines. First, 20% of students couldn't think of a book. Many told us that this question put them on the spot. Some indicated that they don't read books. Students, second, Students more often name books that are typical of high school reading than of college reading. And third, we find that the largest percentage of students name books that focus on self-help and personal development. The bottom line for us here is that very few students demonstrated that college made a difference in the books they would recommend to others. While this was meant to be a fun question, we do take reading seriously and believe that it's a promissory note. It helps to develop higher education capital, which we believe should be the single purpose of higher education. Oops, sorry. Oh, I ended my slides. I'm gonna um, just share them again so you can see. I don't know if people can see that. I will share my contact information in the chat with everybody. And now I'm open for questions or discussion. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, we do have questions, but I'll ask you, uh, what book would you give a graduating senior? I had a feeling you were gonna ask that question. I have always said that Jane Eyre is one of my favorite books. I read it both in high school and also in college. So it wasn't just a high school book, but to me, the, I guess, story of, of a woman's transformation um, is what was important to me. So actually I found the first talk quite um, pertinent to, to that book and why it's important to me. I have some other questions, but let me turn to those that are 
here. Um, <clears throat> Frank Stewart asks, were responses to questions about the meaning of college correlated with students intended majors? And I, I was wondering that too, whether uh, students in the, in the STEM disciplines had uh, different kinds of responses than students in the humanities and, and so on. Yeah, we were actually surprised that we found very few similarities or um, across students and that um, the we found no difference in majors as it related to really any of our findings. And that is across um, mental models, but also higher education capital. We looked for issues of mental health, um, belonging and alienation. And there were no patterns by students' majors. Um, I think we would have predicted that we might have found some that students maybe who focused on humanities and social science might be more uh, willing to talk about some of those kinds of issues or aware or alert to them than maybe um, students who focused on natural sciences, but that was not the case. And here's a question from <clears throat> James Baker. Oh, no, that, that's his recommendation. Wait. I'll save those for a little bit. Um, David Scorton, uh, former president of Cornell. Thanks for a terrific presentation. Student mental health is a growing issue throughout the higher education world. Did you identify interventions that should be pursued? For instance, reducing stigma through a variety of mechanisms, supplying different approaches to counseling and others. Yeah, this is an excellent question. A few things about mental health. First, it was not something that we predicted we would have found when we began the study in 2012, for sure. It's, it's more in the headlines I know now, especially because of the pandemic, but it was prevalent on campuses before. It does seem the case that the more resources that are poured into campuses, the more students come. And that's good news on one hand, because it does seem to be lowering the stigma. Um, but on the other hand, campuses have a hard time keeping up with the pressure that they have from students around um, mental health. Some of the promising interventions um, that we found, and we're not clinicians, and this is not our area of expertise, but some of the promising interventions that we saw were on some campuses like California State Northridge, which had students involved um, in becoming mental health ambassadors on campus and served uh, for students who maybe didn't need clinical help but needed somebody to talk to about some stress and anxiety. They made um, students more aware of the peer counseling efforts and initiatives on campus and those were very helpful. Um, some of these peer counseling efforts were also at other schools like Kenyon College. So, those were helpful. It sort of spreads out the responsibility um, and help that uh, the community can provide because certainly um, these centers on campus were completely overwhelmed. One other point about mental health, which I didn't say in the presentation, is that students described the biggest problem with mental health being the stress and anxiety that students feel to perform and to be perfect, and also to perform and be perfect without even trying, this notion of effortless perfection. And so um, while there are many mental health issues that persist among young people, um, some of the stress and anxiety we feel might be able to be alleviated at younger ages if more is done in the K through 12 system around um, making students feel as though the purpose of education is to have strong GPAs and get good grades only. Well, <clears throat> we have to wrap it up. So let me wrap it up by just listing books that people mentioned. Okay. Um, I, won't, I won't say who mentioned them, but there's one about a book about how the world works today, a book called Growth, from Microorganisms to Mega Cities by Václav Smil. Um, here's one, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, Thornton Wilder's Bridge of San Luis Rey. Um, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. 
And here's somebody who says, um, Jane Eyre is wonderful, but my college age daughters think Jane was a wuss and that she <laughs> should have dumped Mr. Rochester. Um, and I'll just take my, pre presume to take my presidential privilege and say, I would say um, Virginia Woolf's to the lighthouse. Uh, with that note, uh, thank you very much, Wendy and Howard Gardner for your work on this too.